Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you are not a wordless God, but you are a God who has revealed yourself in your word, and your word strengthens us, your word gives us life, your word directs us. And so do those things for us this morning, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, Ma- Matthew, Matthew, we're gonna, really going to start here. This section really starts with the last verse of the last chapter, so I'm going to read that first, okay? Chapter 8, verse 34, moving on to chapter 9. Verse 8, uh, sorry, chapter 8, verse 34. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Now we we'll move on to chapter 9. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. So this is a new section here, and as we said, it began here in this last chapter, and by doing that, by starting in the last verse of the last chapter, we see what is really a tragedy of what happened. The Lord had just done a wonderful miracle for these gathering people in chapter 8, and as they had this man who was possessed with, a de- with devils, more than one, and he had terrorized the whole, the whole town, and the Lord had completely delivered this poor, poor, poor person here, poor soul, and now he's in his right mind. But in the process, the devils left the man, they entered into a herd of pigs, and they destroyed the pigs. And as a result, the people of that city of the Gadarenes begged the Lord to just leave, just please go. The people chose swine over the Savior. And, 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 and just, just like a little foretaste of what's going to happen here when the people will choose a murderer and a thief, Barabbas, over the Lord Jesus, who's the prince of life. So this is what makes it so tragic is this last verse in chapter 8 when it says, they besought him that he would leave their coast. Those words are so tragic because it's exactly what people do today. They're banishing the Lord from their hearts. They don't want the Lord in their lives. They want, verse 34, they would rather he depart out of their coasts. Just like the parable that the Lord told in Luke chapter 19, verse 14. Luke 19, 14, when the Lord said, told this parable, and it said, he said, his citizens hated him, sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Those Gadarenes were saying that. We will not have this man. They, 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 they wanted to leave. They, and, and the tragedy is, the tragedy is, is that in all of the Gospels, we never read that he came back to them again. He never returned again. It was their golden opportunity. It was their opportunity for eternity. And they, they, they said no. And that's the tragedy today with people. They ask God to leave. And he never comes back. That's like what, what, like when Larry King asked uh, Billy Graham's daughter, Ruth Graham, and he asked her, he said, where was God on 9-11? And she replied, God was exactly where we asked him to be. be, to be. We wanted him to leave our schools. We wanted him to leave our, our country. We wanted him to leave our courts. We wanted him to leave our, our government. And he said, okay, and he did. And for the many who, 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 the many, many people who have gotten my book, the, the change changed, I can see clearly in those responses such an anger against God, such a, such a I'm so tired of God, 
such a, a I'm so offended that, that someone would mail me a book about God. They're just like the Gadarenes who asked God to leave, and I'm afraid that God has taken them at their word and has agreed and has left. And, 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 and when we see that, our prayer for those people is, is, is the hymn, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And if a lost person wants, 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 wants the Lord to leave, and he wants to leave the Lord, if he wants to leave, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7.15, 1 Corinthians 7.15, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. Now, it's interesting in history that when the Romans started their bloody wars under Titus against Israel, that they started, their first city was this city. It was the, the city of the Gadarenes. And, and, and we can imagine that just like Larry King asked Ruth Graham, we can imagine those, those Gadarenes asking when, that, when those wars started and their, their city was besieged by the Romans, and they said, where was God when the Romans destroyed us? And just like Billy Graham's daughter, then the answer was, God is just where you asked him to be in the end of this chapter 8, verse 34. They besought him that he would depart out of their coast. So now chapter 9, verse 1, opens with the Lord leaving the Gadarenes and coming to what's called his own city. So the contrast between these two places is just remarkable. On one side of the lake, the Gadarenes rejected him and they wanted him to leave. And on the other side of the lake, in the city of Capernaum, they wanted him. And they wanted him to stay there. This shows that the Lord will not stay long when he's not welcome. But he'll stay forever to a person who welcomes him and craves his presence. Now, it's interesting in verse 1 because it says there in verse 1 that he comes to a place which is called his own city. Now, you might think when it says his own city... What's the first city that comes to your mind? What is it? It's Nazareth. It's where he was grew up, right? That's his own city. But this is not referring to Nazareth. This, as I said, is referring to the city of Capernaum because now Capernaum has become his own city. And, 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 and uh, Nazareth is no longer his own city. So what happened? What happened to Nazareth? Why is Nazareth no longer called his own city? Nazareth fell from being the Lord's own city. Capernaum was elevated to being his own city. And the reason Nazareth was, Nazareth was no longer his own city is because of what we're going to find out in Matthew 13, 54. Matthew 13, 54, when it says, when he was come into his own country, that's Nazareth. He taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished, and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. That's it. It was their unbelief that the city of Nazareth had because they said, Don't we know his father? Reminds me of one time when I was in the desert with Pastor Jim. And there was a group of Orthodox rabbis walking around there. And I said to Jim, stop the car. I want to go talk to him. And Jim said, are you sure you want to do that? I said, yes. So we stopped the car. I went running up to them. I was so eager. I was a new believer. And oh, I go running up to them. And I said, oh, you know, the prophecies that Jesus died for our sins. And I would just, I presented about a, a, a few minutes sermon there, power-packed sermon. I was very convinced myself. But I remember the rabbis started to stroke their beards. You know, they all have beards. Started to stroke their beards and, and, and tilted their head up and looked down at me through their glasses like this. 
And they said, I, I, I didn't catch it. Uh, which yeshiva did you go to? <laughs> What's their response? Which yeshiva was it that you went to? I didn't catch the name. And I was so mad. And I went running back to the, I went back to the car and I slammed the door. And Jim said, how'd it go? And I said, don't ask. <laughs> it was so bad. <clears throat> uh, don't, 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 don't we know his father? You know, the lowly carpenter over there. Don't we know his brothers? You know those ones. You know, don't we know his sisters? Oh, no. That was Nazareth. That was unbelief. And they fell as a result of being called his own city. And now they, uh, and now it was it, 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 Capernaum. Because Capernaum couldn't get enough of the Lord. And therefore, they got the title, his own city. Now, as soon as the Lord arrived by ship in Capernaum, we read in verse 2, Behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. Now, this, this account here of the healing of the paralyzed man called the man of palsy, the paralyzed man, is recorded in the other Gospels of Mark and Luke. And from those accounts, it's valuable for us to look at it because we can get a more full picture of what happened. So when we look at Mark 2, in the first four verses of Mark 2, we read in Mark 2, 1, Again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. So you get the picture here. Very crowded around the door. And he preached the word unto them, and, they, and, they, and they, they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, Clint, we're going to need you there to fix that roof. <laughs> they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lie. Now that's valuable information. And that's basically telling us it was a jam-packed meeting where, where people were jammed up against the door. No way you were going to squeeze your way through that door. Now we look at Luke 5.17. Luke 5.17 for the other information where it says, It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of law sitting by which came out of every town in Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man who was taken a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they, they, they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up upon the roof housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst of before Jesus. So what we get from Luke is that People were coming from all over every town in Galilee, all over Judea, even Jerusalem, which is quite a long ways away. And, and, and these, these four men that we learned about in Luke 4, in uh, Luke, Luke, uh, Luke 2, that, I mean Mark 2, that we learned about there, they, they, were, they tried to get in the door and they couldn't. And so they, they made their way up to the, the housetop and they took off the tiling. We get very specific about what they took off. Uh, the roof, they took it apart. So the scene is quite dramatic from what we, what we learn from all these accounts. And, and, and first of all, the Lord's in just one house. He's not in an auditorium. And the people come from all over the place. And, and there were specifically, as it calls out here, there were, the, in, in Luke 5, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law, if you will. And they're all crowded in there, and there's no spare place. And so, and then this group, this is a group, now the four men, each one carrying a corner of the bed. They're carrying four corners. They're carrying the bed. And they've got a man on there who's totally paralyzed. He probably couldn't even talk. And, and, and a, this man is very disabled. There's no way that he himself could get to the Lord by himself. And these friends were great friends. They were great friends. They were loyal. They all agreed they're going to carry this disabled man to the Lord where he could be healed. Those are great friends, great friends. They're going to take their, their, their place in the hall of great friends along with the centurion who was a great friend. 
to his servant who came to the Lord for and sent people to the Lord so he could be healed, the servant. And great friends, great friends. The mother-in-law of, of Peter was also uh, disabled. She was feverish. She could not get off her bed. Great friends went to get the Lord for her. We are great friends when we go and bring others to the Lord in prayer or in person. That's a great friend. And, and they, and they, and they want to set the, these great friends want to set the man directly in front of the Lord, and they can't do it, and these great friends see the obstacle, and they, they say, okay, wh- wh- what's plan B, fellas? And one of them says, roof, off they go, up to the top there, top of the rooftop, careful calculation, where do you think he is under this roof? Oh, he's got to be here, that's the spot, okay. Off the tiles go. Off the roof comes apart. Then people say, what are you doing to my roof? Never mind. More important. And, and, and the, you can imagine, can you imagine when they take off that last tile and look down? Oh, we did it right there. He is right down there. there. Don't drop the tile on him. All right. and, then, and then they get the four ropes, attach it to the rope to every corner, carefully lower the bed with the paralyzed man down in, 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 in front there, and the man lands, the paralyzed man lands right in front of the Lord. Wow, that's wonderful. Now, when the Lord saw this sight, his primary focus was not on the condition of the paralyzed man. That's not what he saw talked about in verse 2. It says, it doesn't say, and Jesus seeing the paralyzed man. It says, and Jesus seeing their faith. So the Lord just just look at the, the paralyzed man on the road below, uh, uh, and the, and, and the, and the, but he also looked up at those four men up there holding the ropes, and he sees faith. He sees faith. He sees faith of the paralyzed man, of course, but the Lord sees the faith of the four men up there holding the ropes, and and he, and what what kind of faith of this? What kind of faith does he see? Does the Lord see? Well, first of all, the Lord sees an active faith. It's not a passive faith. It's an active faith. Those men went to a lot of work to bring their friend to the house. And those four, and those four men went to a lot of work to not be willing to give up when there was a big crowd there. They did not say, oh, well, you know, there's no way, sir. Let's, let's know you another day. No. They went to a lot of work when they went up on the roof, when they took the roof apart, when they, that was an active faith that saw no obstacles. And that's what active faith does. Active faith does not see obstacles. It sees challenges that will be overcome. Laughs. Faith. Mighty faith. The promise sees the promises of God. Laughs at impossibilities and, and, and Christ. It shall be done. That's what they did. And because they had a faith with works, it was an act of faith, as James 2.14 puts it, James 2.14. What doth it profit? You four men, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? What doth it profit if you believe that the Lord can heal this person if you don't get up on the roof and take that, that, those tiles off? Is he going to be healed just because of your faith with no works on your, no. It, it, James 2.17, James 2.17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. You can say to those four men, your faith is dead. You will not get the healing of your friend unless you have the works to, 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 to do it. Faith without works, James 2.20. Faith without works is dead. Uh, <clears throat> many verses in James 2 about that. Okay. Now, this was not, for this people, these four men, this was not just a, hey, guys, Let's bring our paralyzed friend to see if Jesus can heal him. This was not an experiment for them. It was an expectation. They knew their friend would be healed. And we can imagine them talking to their, can you imagine them talking to their paralyzed friend as they're going down? I don't know what his name was. Maybe it was Ralph. Ralph, you're going to be healed. Ralph. Today's the last day you're going to be paralyzed. Ralph, you're, going to get, we no, you're no longer going to be carried around. That's the kind of faith those four men had. That's the kind of faith that, 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 the, that the leper and the centurion had as well. It's not like if you can do it, do it. 
But it was like, we know you can do it. The fa- leper had the faith of the Lord's ability. He said in Mark 8, 2, in the previous chapter, Behold, there came a leper, worshiped him, and saying, If thou wilt, not if thou can, but if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Thou canst. The leper w- wasn't sure the Lord was willing, but the centurion was sure of the Lord's ability and of his willingness, for he said, in the previous chapter, the, the centurion said about a servant, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, he goeth. To another, come, he cometh. To my servant, do this, he doeth it. He said, I know you can do this. I know you've got servants that can't be seen that will do this. So the Lord not only saw an active faith on the part of these men, he also saw a humble faith. This was a humble faith. I mean, those, those, those men didn't say, well, somebody asked the Lord to come over to this house here and heal our, our friend. No, no. They said, we're going to bring our friend to the Lord. That's humility. And he not only saw a humble faith, he not only saw an active faith, he saw a simple faith, a simple faith. The, their request of those four men was no words. They didn't say, hey, Lord, can you heal our friend down there or up there? Yeah. He, he, he didn't say that. They didn't say anything, as a matter of fact. They didn't need to speak because their actions spoke it all. What they, what they did spoke it all. They just lowered the man in front of the Lord, and that's all they had to say. And then when the Lord looked up, he saw this anticipation, this expectation, this confidence that the Lord was going to heal their friend, the happiness. Okay? Now, the Lord goes to reward their faith in a very wonderful way. He turns to the man, the paralyzed man, in verse 2. And said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. So first of all, the Lord addresses this paralyzed man with the title of son. That's wonderful. It's like saying child. Reminds me of my five-year-old, my five-year-old grandson, Colton, with leukemia, who, who came over to the house for dinner on Friday, last Friday night, a couple days ago. And, and I, I was watching him. And he just would run to his mom and bury his head in her side and wrap his arms around his mom. Why? Comfort, comfort. It's kind of like this a very tender thing when the Lord calls this man son. It's a very tender address. It's really an address of assurance. Son, as a father would not deny a son, I'm going to give this son his assurance. Just like the thief on the cross who was in desperate need of assurance he, was, he, he, he knew he was going to die. He wasn't worried about dying. He was worried about what's going to happen to him after he dies. He wants the Lord, can you just remember me? Remember me when you get to your kingdom? And the Lord, in a, such a very tender way, same way, from the cross said in Luke 23, 43, Jesus, Luke 23, 43, Jesus saith, said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So there he is. There's that man on the cross, that thief on the cross. He's scared. He's anxious. He's worried. Here's this paralyzed man also. He's scared. He's anxious. He's worried. What's he worried about? Well, one of my friends don't choose the right place to lower me down through the roof. You know, what, what, what if Jesus has moved on to some other place in the house there and I get let down the wrong place? What if my friends drop me? You know, what if Jesus gets angry? He's been interrupted. He's in the middle of teaching. There's this man who gets lowered down. What, what if the enemies of the Lord block him from healing me? So the Lord sees all these thoughts in his heart, his worry, anxiety, and he says to him, son, be of good cheer. That paralyzed man, to hear that, that, that through the battles, we, 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 we talked about in the breaking of bread earlier this morning, we, we talked about, Ken brought up a hymn and said that there was a part of that hymn that said the Lord had unshaken love, unshaken love. And so here was the Lord unshaken by all that was going on there and through the discouragement of, of a group of people who th- were thinking evil thoughts against him, the Lord breaks through and says, son, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Now, if you were to say to a person today, what would make you feel good cheer? Be of good cheer, your money is going to increase. Be of good cheer, your stocks are going to double in the stock market. Be of good cheer, you're going to marry the person of your dreams. Be of good cheer, you're going to make so much accomplishments in life. Be of good cheer, you're going to retire early 
and you're going to go live in Hawaii. Be of good cheer. You're going to have a great reputation. Everybody's going to admire you. They're going to, they're going to praise you. Be of good cheer. You're going to be healed from your cancer, from your diabetes, from your heart disease. This is what typical people, this is what people typically think of when they think of be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. These are things that will make me happy. Be of good cheer. But, but be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Oh, people are thinking today, you can keep that be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Just give me the be of good cheer that I'm going to be healed, that I'm going to have a great reputation, I'm going to have money, I'm going to have possessions, enjoy myself, be successful. That's what I want. I want that be of good cheer. But the be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven? Now, come on. And the reason that people think that way today is because we live in a day of Esau. This is a day of Esau who when presented with the be of good cheer, here's some food for your hungry belly, or, or be of good cheer, here's a, a birthright to be God's man, God's representative on earth. The day of Esau said, and that's where he lived the day of Esau, Esau said in Genesis 25, 32, Genesis 25, 32, Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? What profit is it thy sins are forgiven thee? And most people join Esau today and say, what good is a birthright to me? I need something for the here and now. And most people say, what good is sins forgiven to me? I need something for the here and now. But the Lord said to this man, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And when the Lord did that, he was fulfilling, carrying out, doing his mission for which he came to earth to bring forgiveness of sins, which he would then, the basis for which, accomplish on the cross. That was on the cross where we just were this morning. We're again reminding, remembering, as the Lord said in Matthew 26, 28, Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for, the men, for many for the remission of sins. Now, in verse 2, it's very important and very significant to see one word in that, and that, that word is not another word. It's very important to see the word be and not are when he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. There's a big difference from him saying the Lord did not say Thy sins are forgiven thee. He said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And that's not a statement that his sins had been forgiven, as in, Thy sins are forgiven thee. That's a command. Like this morning, if I would say to Ken, Ken, those canopies be up. <laughs> All right? It's a command. See, it's a command as if the Lord said, with my voice, I command that your sins are forgiven, be forgiven. That's the same commanding voice that the Lord used in Genesis 1-3, in the creation of light, Genesis 1-3, when he commanded light, it says in Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And this is the same commanding voice the Lord used when he commanded life, into that dead body of Lazarus in John eleven forty three. John eleven forty three, when he had said thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, "Lazarus, come forth!" And he that was dead came forth, bound head and foot with grave clothes. His, his, his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, "Loose him, let him go." That's the same commanding voice that the Lord used in the previous chapter in, in, in verse 3, Matthew 8, 3, Matthew 8, 3, Jesus put forth his hands and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. That's the same commanding voice that the Lord uses for us to command that our sins be forgiven, our souls to be cleansed on the day, at the time, when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's what happens to everyone who comes to the Lord as a dirty, rotten sinner, thirsty for God, and the Lord Jesus points to that person and says, be forgiven, be cleansed. That's the commanding voice that he gave to the paralyzed man, a free pardon where the paralyzed man, what did the paralyzed man do 
to get this wonderful pardon of forgiven sins. Well, he couldn't do anything. He was paralyzed. He couldn't even talk. He could do nothing. It was 100% a gift of grace. That's what grace looks like. This is what grace looks like. It's so great a gift, so undeserved. Now, the big, big question that's on the table here is that why did the Lord start with forgiveness of sins when the man had, was needed to be healed? He's paralyzed already. So why do you start with forgiveness of sins? Why didn't you say you are healed and your sins are forgiven? Why didn't you do that? Why did he say your, fins are, your sins are forgiven and later he's healed? Well, several reasons, but one of them, soul sickness is more important. Is there a person whose body is healed and not his soul? Absolutely, yes. Is there a person whose soul is healed and their body is not healed? Absolutely, yes. So again, why did the Lord start with first, son, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven? Okay, maybe we can kind of get a picture like this. I want you to picture in your minds a person, a convicted criminal condemned to death. He's on death row. He's on death row. Get that. Okay. This person also has very severe diabetes. Very severe diabetes. He has to check his sugar level throughout the day. He's taking insulin all the time. His diabetes, he's got, he's lost toes over his diabetes. He's very sick. He's got, he's got, he's got a lot of issues with the diabetes. Now, picture the time of his execution that it's come. And the cell door opens for his final walk to his execution. And now he's walking to the execution room. Now picture a doctor running up to him and saying, I've got a wonderful cure for your diabetes, an injection. And the doctor injects him with the injection, and instantly the man is cured from his diabetes. And the doctor says, there, now you're cured from your, di your diabetes. You'll never have to check your blood sugar again. You'll never have to be injected with insulin again. But he's still on his way to his execution, okay, <laughs> even though his diabetes is cured. So which of the two statements does that man want to hear? Be of good cheer, your diabetes is cured. Or be of good cheer, the governor has issued a pardon and your execution has been canceled. What difference does it make if his diabetes is killed for the short time he has to live because he's on his way to his execution? The cure of the diabetes pales in the face of his looming ex execution. And anything short of a pardon of mercy is, is, is just inconsiderable. The same is true with regard to physical healing of the lost. What difference does it make if an ailment is cured for the short amount of time that a person has to live if his sins are not forgiven and he's facing an eternity of hell? The cure of a physical problem pales in the face of being judged for sins and being cast into hell. Anything short of a pardon of mercy for sins that they've been forgiven and the eternity of hell has been canceled is inconsiderable. And that's the reason why the Lord said to this man, really good news that's going to make you happy in verse 3, son, be of good cheer, thy sins are for be forgiven thee. And the reason why the Lord did not address his paralysis at first is because the Lord sees the present problem in relation to the future unending problem, and he addresses the more important future problem. And that's the sight that you and I need to have when we see lost people, that the most important problem is their future problem, where am I going to spend eternity? And if that, and if that man were only told that his sins were forgiven and not healed, he has, he's a winner. He's a winner that day. Paral paralysis and all. But if that para paralyzed man was only told that you've been healed from your paralysis and your sins were not forgiven, he's a loser. He's a loser that day. Hezekiah looked at the immediate uh, problem when he was close to death with a sickness that was, that, that was and, and here's a man who was the highest position in Israel. He was the king. And he says, you know what really robs me of my peace? It's not this sickness. 
Hezekiah, Isaiah 38, 17. Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had bitterness. But thou in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. There he is talking about the day of his great transformation. The day of Hezekiah's great transformation. That was the day when God in love saved his soul. When God cast all the sins of Hezekiah behind his back. Now comes a problem. The first opposition, real strong opposition, is, is now coming. It comes from a certain group of people in this large crowd, a group of the Pharisees, a group of the scribes, a group of the scribes, ones who were scribes. They copied the scriptures. They were responsible for the scriptures. Their opposition is strong. They're accusing the Lord of blasphemy. And when the Lord is here fulfilling his mission bringing the greatest benefit that he could to man, pronouncement of the forgiveness of sins, and now the Lord's condemned by this group who's com saying he's committing blasphemy. Now the basis for them accusing him of blasphemy is given to us in Mark 2, Mark 2, 6 and 7, parallel passage. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? They, 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 they had just heard that Jesus had forgiven sins, and they reasoned no one can forgive sins except for God, and they were 100% right. They were 100% correct. Only God forgives sins. As it says in Isaiah 43, 25, Isaiah 43, 25, God says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. They were 100% right because God forgives sins. That's what, that's what Micah says, Micah 7.18, Micah 7.18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? They were 100% right because they remembered from Exodus, from Exodus 34.6, that it's only God who forgives sins when the Lord proclaimed his name to Moses, and it says in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's God. They were 100% right. Only God forgives sins. But they were 100% wrong in saying the Lord was guilty of blasphemy because they ignored a few other important scriptures. They ignored the scripture of Isaiah 7.14, Isaiah 7.14, where it was predicted, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. There would be a son born who would have the name, the unique name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. That son would be God who would be with us. They ignored the scripture in Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah 9, 9, 6. For unto us, unto the Jewish people, unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name will be called, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. The child that would be born would be called the mighty God because he was the mighty God. Those scribes reached the wrong conclusion because they did not reason this way. No one can for sin, forgive sins but God. Okay. First point. Jesus has just forgiven sins. Okay. Third point. Conclusion. Jesus must be God. That's what they missed. They missed the Isaiah 7:14 son who is God with us. They missed the Isaiah 9:6 child who, was, who would be called the mighty God. And they came to the wrong conclusion because they started with a wrong premise. And their premise was, Jesus cannot be God. And that's what so many today start with. Jesus cannot be God, Jehovah Witnesses. Jesus cannot be God, most of the Jewish people. Jesus cannot be God. Wrong. Wrong understanding of who God is. <clears throat> they, th they thought, this one? Meek, lowly of heart, humble, never. That's not who God is because they didn't know who God was. And that's what God said in Jeremiah 4.22. Jeremiah 4.22. 
my people is foolish, they have not known me. Hosea 5, uh, 4, Hosea 5, 4. They have not known the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 21, 1 Corinthians 1, 21. The world by wisdom knew not God. And, and if they came to a crowd and God was in the crowd, they wouldn't know him. They wouldn't recognize him. They didn't. They reasoned wrong because they concluded that Jesus cannot be God. They reasoned wrong when they accused the Lord of blasphemy. But all their reasoning was happening privately. It says in verse nine, uh, verse 3, chapter 9, verse 3. The scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemies. They were saying all of this just to themselves. They were saying all of this inside of them. They were saying all of this in their thoughts. And then verse 4, verse 4 says, Jesus knowing their thoughts. Jesus heard what they were saying to themselves. Jesus heard what they were saying inside of them. Jesus knew all their thoughts, which shows us the Lord Jesus hears what we say inside ourselves. The Lord Jesus hears what we, what, what, what we say to ourselves. The Lord Jesus knows all our thoughts, just like the Bible says in Hebrews 4.13. Hebrews 4.13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Just like David understood. David understood when he wrote Psalm 139.2. Psalm 139.2. Thou understandest my thought afar off. So in response to their thoughts, in response to the thoughts of these scribes, the Lord condemned them in verse 4 when he said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Now, that shows us, and the application to us, it shows us what we should be confessing as sin to the Lord Jesus. Our thoughts, as it says in Proverbs 24, 9. Proverbs 24, 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. Deuteronomy 15, 9. Deuteronomy 15, 9. Moses said, Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart. It was the thoughts that, that God talked about when he condemned the world to die by a flood in Genesis 6, 5, Genesis 6, 5, the, law saw, the Lord, <clears throat> sorry, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And because of that, he said, got to go. Start over. Matthew 5, 28, Matthew 5, 28. I say unto you, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, that's, of course, my thoughts. Have committed adultery with her already in his heart. Evil thoughts are sin, and they need to be forgiven as wrong thoughts. And not only, evil, not only the evil thoughts are sinful, evil thoughts make a person dirty in their soul, which is why we have this precious verse in Revelation 1.5. Revelation 1.5, Jesus Christ loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's why we have the, the great fountain opened in Zechariah 13.1. Zechariah 13.1. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. That fountain was both for sin and uncleanness. It's our, it's our thoughts that we need to confess to the Lord when it says in 1 John 1.9, 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That confession is both for forgiveness of sins and cleansing from sin. So when the scribes accused the Lord in their hearts of blasphemy, the, the game was on. The conflict had escalated. And this was the start of an opposition by the leaders that the Lord just had to endure through. He had to endure through, as it says in Hebrews 12.3, Hebrews 12.3, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Now, the Lord now gives a response to their thoughts in verse 9, in verse 9, Matthew 9, 5, verse, sorry, verse 5, verse 5. Matthew 9, 5, when he says, For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know 
Then Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then he saith to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thy house. So as he said here, <clears throat> the main issue on the table is, is Jesus God? That's the issue. The Lord Jesus has done what only God can do, forgive sins. And with that act, he proclaimed that he is God, and the scribes knew it. That's the issue. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus the great God who proclaimed himself to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus 3.14, Exodus 3.14, with the name I am? That's what he did. Because the issue here is that no one can be saved and go to heaven unless they believe that Jesus is the great I am of Exodus 3.14. That's what he said in John 8.24, John 8.24. I said therefore unto you, you shall die in your sins. If you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. That was, that is the central issue today of who Jesus is. Is Jesus God? Now the Lord, as we saw here, has just done something that only God can do. He's just pronounced, proclaimed, commanded, sins be forgiven. Now the Lord has chosen to do something else that only God can do. Only God. In Exodus 15, 26, Exodus 15, 26, it is God who said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. So the Lord's going to heal this paralyzed man, and when he does that, he's going to speak to those experts of the scriptures right out of Exodus 15, 26, the verse I just read, Exodus 15, 26, that only the Lord heals. As a matter of fact, the Lord is, gonna, is, is really speaking to these experts in the scriptures right out of Psalm 103.3, Psalm 103.3, which puts the two together of the forgiveness of this man's sins and the healing of this paralyzed man. When it says in Psalm 103.3 that God is he who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. So the Lord has just, has just forgiven the paralyzed man of all his sins. Now he's going to heal this paralyzed man. And in the same way that the Lord commanded the sins be forgiven of the paralyzed man, now the Lord is going to command the healing of the paralyzed man with just one word. And we can imagine the Lord in verse 2, as he pointed to the man and said, Thy sins be forgiven. And now in, in, in verse 6, we can imagine him also pointing to the, to the paralyzed man and commanding again, arise. And the result is, verse 7, he arose, departed to his house. Now the effect of the, the first command that Jesus gave him, verse 2, forgiven, no one could see that. Scribes couldn't see that. No one can see it. Who can see if his sins are forgiven or not? Can't see that. Right? But the effect of the second command, arise, was obvious seen by all. The scribes saw this paralyzed man healed by the command of Jesus, and by extension, they should have concluded, same person commanded sins forgiven, must be sins forgiven. So in order to appeal to their reason, for them to be able to see that Jesus was God, in order to, to, to lead them to bow their knees as dirty, rotten sinners and come to Jesus to save them from their sins, we see the Lord really wants this healing to be dramatic to them. He's up in the, dr the drama here for those scribes so they could see this is a complete healing of the paralyzed man. And this is how the Lord made that healing so dramatic. Now the scene again. Mark 2, 3. Mark 2, 3. They come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So again, the bed of the paralyzed man is attached by four ropes, four friends, each one holding a rope, lowering him down. Now, the Lord could have just said to the paralyzed man what he, what he was implying he was going to say in verse 5, arise and walk. So it says in verse 5. If I say to the man, arise and walk. But he wanted to increase the drama here. So for everyone, in fact, everyone's probably expecting him in verse, from verse 5 to say, arise and walk. But he's using the healing of this paralyzed man to drive a point. The point is Jesus is God. So to step it up a notch, he, he, he doesn't say what he said in verse 5, he doesn't say, arise and walk. It would be the natural thing for the Lord to have done. And then, the, and then the Lord could have looked up and say, hey, you guys, as soon as he gets up, bed up, carry it home for him. 
Instead, in essence, he's looking up there and he's saying to the guys, drop your ropes. You know, the guys, the guys up there are saying, drop our ropes. How are we going to get the bed back? The Lord means drop the ropes. Because he didn't say in verse 5, arise and walk. He said in verse 6, arise, take up thy bed, you former paralyzed man, and go unto thy house. And the paralyzed man didn't say, take up my bed? I haven't gotten up in years. My muscles have deteriorated. I'm not sure I can even get up, much less carry this heavy bed anywhere. And that's what everybody in the room was thinking. But the Lord was stepping up the drama here. The paralyzed man, is, he, he, he was able to do that because only God could do that double miracle, healing him and giving his muscles strength back to pick it up because Jesus was God. Now, we read their response of the people in verse 8 where it says, uh, they saw the miracle. Verse 8 says, when, they, when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power to men. That's a very interesting statement because in that there are two responses from the crowd. Their first response was they marveled. Their second response was they glorified God. Actually, those are two of three responses, the third response they didn't have, that are possible when anyone sees a miracle of the Lord. And we live in a world of miracles. The functioning of our bodies is a miracle. The growth of those trees is a miracle. We're surrounded by the Lord's miracles, and there are three levels of response to seeing the Lord's miracle. The first level of response is in the word in verse 8, marveled. <clears throat> that's the wow response. That's the that's amazing response. That's, the, that's fantastic that's the first level of response. The second level of response is to see a miracle and say, how good is God? How great is God? <clears throat> that's seen in verse 8 where it says, they glorified God. That's to be thankful. That's to praise the Lord. As in, I praise you, God, for being so good to have done this miracle. That's level two. But now there's a third level response, which is not, which the crowd is not saying the crowd did. This is the learning response. This is the response of, from this, what I see, I learn and understand about the unseen. This is, that miracle is a parable that teaches me. This is the third level of response. It's receiving instruction from a spiritual truth, which, is, which the Gospels are full of, as the Lord was saying. You can see the change of the sky, but you can't discern the times. Full of. It's to, be, it's to get the spiritual truth as a benefit from a miracle. For example, in this miracle here of the healing of the blind man, I'm sorry, of the healing of the paralyzed man, they could have said he healed a totally disabled, paralyzed man. Hmm. My sin has made me totally disabled and paralyzed in my love for God or ability to go, do good, he can heal my spiritual paralysis. Okay? For example, in the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplying of a few loaves and few fishes to feed 5,000, the first level is, wow, a small amount fed 5,000? The second level is, oh, Lord, you fed the hungry people. You're so caring. I praise you for being so loving and caring. But the third level is to see from the feeding of those 5,000 with so little, I see the bread and the fishes as heavenly nourishment for my soul. And I learned from that miracle how you can feed my soul with so little, so, so little I read from the word of God and it feeds me. We live in a world of God's creations, of God's creations all around us, miracle, miraculous creations. We live in a museum. We're like in a museum, a museum called the like unto's, the museum of like unto's. Just think of what it would be like if you came to a museum of the like unto's and when you got to the door of the museum, you were given a piece of paper and it had all the displays on there in the museum and a blank spot by each display. And then you were told, your job is to go to the museum and write down what you learn from each one of the displays. That's what we are. We are in a museum of like unto's and everything that we see in this museum of miracles designed to teach us. Now, it's, uh, the passage now ends in verse eight with an observation of the men, which is in verse 8, where it says that God has given such power unto men. 
That's an, uh, that, that, that was one unmistakable fact that they saw there, and that was that Jesus was a 100% man. He had just proved that he was 100% God. They saw him as 100% God, and that was the teaching that, he, that, was, that, that came across there. He is 100% God, and he is 100% man, both God and man at the same time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus who healed this paralyzed man in such a dramatic way. Thank you for his love for the scribes. Thank you for his love for us. Thank you for his love for every lost, hell-bound sinner that he might, desires with all of his heart, to say, thy sins be forgiven thee. We pray in Jesus' name.